What if I told you that one of the most important engines in Formula One history started life as something everyone openly mocked? An engine so unreliable it boiled over almost every weekend, so unpredictable it scared its own drivers, and so violently powerful that once it finally worked, the entire F1 grid had to rewrite their engines just to keep up. This tiny 1.5-liter V6 didn't just win races, it detonated the old rulebook, forced the FIA to rethink the future of the sport, and shoved Formula 1 straight into the turbo era whether anyone liked it or not. And the craziest part? When it finally came on boost, it didn't sound like an engine anymore. It sounded like pure mechanical violence. <laughs> Welcome back to Hidden Car Gems, the channel where we talk about cars that make absolutely no sense. And today, we're diving into the F1 engine that went from the paddock joke to the motor that nearly broke the entire sport. Let's get into it. Back in the late 1970s, the F1 rulebook had one tiny line almost nobody paid attention to. Teams could run a 3-liter naturally aspirated engine or a 1.5-liter turbocharged engine. Every big team laughed at that second option. Ferrari? Too small. Lotus? Too experimental. Tyrrell? Too risky. Cosworth? Why bother? But Renault looked at it like a golden ticket. They took their 2.0-liter endurance V6, chopped it down to 1.5 liters, kept the 90-degree V angle, strengthened the cast iron block, slapped on aluminum heads, stuffed forged pistons into it, and then bolted on a turbocharger the size of a watermelon. That engine, the EF1, made around 510 horsepower, which was insane for its size in the late 70s. But everything else about it was a disaster. The turbo lag was biblical. You'd floor the throttle, wait forever, and then get hit with power so violently you'd swear someone rear-ended you with a freight train. And reliability? Forget it. The engine smoked like a chimney. It overheated. It detonated. It spewed oil like a pressure washer set to catastrophic failure. Sometimes it blew up while warming up. Sometimes it blew up before the mechanics even touched the starter motor. Marshals would literally prepare their fire extinguishers the moment they saw the yellow car approach. That's when it earned its iconic nickname, the Yellow Teapot. Because every time it broke, which was constantly, it puffed out steam like someone boiled it dry. The entire F1 paddock laughed. Commentators joked about it. Drivers said racing next to the Renault felt like standing near a grenade with a loose pin. But Renault didn't stop. They didn't get embarrassed. They didn't quit. They treated every explosion like a lesson, every fire like a data point, every sarcastic comment like motivation. Because Renault had figured out something the rest of the grid didn't understand yet. Boost doesn't care about displacement. And in 1979, they proved it. Renault replaced the giant single turbo with two smaller turbos, one per cylinder bank, faster spool, better response, way less lag. Suddenly, the car wasn't an unpredictable ticking bomb. It was actually fast. Then came the 1979 French Grand Prix at dijon prenois Jean-Pierre Jabouille took pole, and then he won the race. The first turbo victory in Formula One history. And right here, before we go deeper, let me slide something in. I love making these deep dive videos into forgotten monsters, insane engines, and the craziest stories in motorsport. But this channel only grows because of you guys. So if you're enjoying this video so far, hit subscribe, drop a comment, and help me push this channel even further. The more we grow together, the more insane engines I can cover for you. All right, let's crank the boost. After Dijon, everything changed. Not for Renault, for everyone else. Suddenly, Ferrari scrambled to build their own twin-turbo V6. BMW started cooking up an engine that began life as an old road car block pulled from scrap yards. Honda entered with surgical precision. Porsche teamed up with McLaren to create a dynasty. The turbo war had begun, and Renault had lit the fuse. As the EF engine evolved, it became unrecognizable. Boost pressures climbed higher and higher. Fuel mixtures became, let's just say, scientifically questionable. Intercoolers doubled in size. Turbos spun faster than blender blades on max set. Temperatures soared, and the power numbers went from impressive to ridiculous to completely unhinged. Yeah. 
In race trim, Renault's later engines were comfortably above 800 horsepower. But in qualifying? Oh boy. Nobody knows the exact number because every engineer lied to everyone else. But it's widely accepted they passed 1,000 horsepower from a 1.5 liter V6. That shouldn't be possible. At full power, the exhaust glowed bright red. Flames blasted out of the back on every liftoff. The turbo noise sounded like a jet inhaling the track. And the moment the boost hit, the car shook like it was trying to escape its driver. The sound it made under full load didn't even resemble a car anymore. It was metallic, violent, chaotic, like the engine itself was screaming for mercy. Drivers had to relearn how to use the throttle. Turn in was okay, mid corner was manageable, but corner exit? That was when you prayed the boost didn't hit early. If it did, good night. The car snapped sideways harder than anything before or since. Senna called the power delivery violent. Prost described it as dynamite with wheels. Even Arnoux said, if the boost arrived at the wrong moment, you were finished. And Renault wasn't done. They wanted more RPM, more airflow, more combustion, more power. So they dropped a bombshell innovation, pneumatic valve springs. Before this, every engine used steel springs. They worked until you started revving toward the moon. Then they bounced, floated, or snapped. Renault replaced them with nitrogen-charged pneumatic systems. Suddenly, this tiny V6 could scream past 12,000 RPM, even approach 13,000 in qualifying. More RPM meant more air, more fuel, more boom, more power. And this single innovation became so good, so effective, so game-changing, that every F1 engine today still uses pneumatic valves. This little V6 didn't just compete, it redefined the rulebook. By 1985 and 1986, Renault engines powered the Lotus 98T, one of the fastest F1 cars ever built. Down long straights, the car hit 350 kilometers per hour, shaking, twitching, and sounding like a metal dragon coughing fire. Full throttle in this thing didn't sound like acceleration. It sounded like war, like the engine was actively trying to escape the car. Senna manhandled it like he was wrestling a mechanical beast. Flames shot out every downshift. The boost hit like a truck, and onboards from that era still look unreal today. Pure chaos, pure violence, pure adrenaline. But the turbo war was reaching apocalypse levels. Speeds kept climbing, cars kept braking, drivers kept fighting for control. Engines kept detonating with dramatic enthusiasm. Tires weren't ready, brakes weren't ready, circuits weren't ready. The FIA looked at the data and basically said, okay, this is getting stupid. Fuel limits were introduced, boost limits followed, and by 1989, turbos were banned entirely. Just like that, the craziest era in F1 engine history was over. But the legacy of Renault's EF Turbo V6, untouchable. It didn't win the most titles. It wasn't the final boss of the turbo era. It wasn't the most reliable, but it was the first. The pioneer, the engine that proved turbos, were the future. The engine that forced Ferrari, Honda, BMW and Porsche to adapt or die. The engine that introduced technology the sport still uses. And the engine that gave the world the wildest horsepower war it has ever seen. From a paddock joke, to a fire-breathing legend, to the blueprint of modern F1 engines. And before we wrap this up, I just want to say thank you. This channel exploded faster than I ever expected, and it's all because of you. If you want more insane F1 engines, forgotten supercars, or mechanical madness, hit subscribe and stick around. We're just getting warmed up. The Renault EF Turbo V6 wasn't just an engine. It was a revolution, a loophole turned into a legend. A mechanical monster that forced Formula One into a new era and one of the greatest hidden car gems in racing history.